Yeah. All right, so this morning we have a, a really full program, which is awesome. We have Stories, Plant Tell by Carolyn Rosier from the Dallas County Master Gardener Association. And then we'll take a quick break and we do the, a membership vote. We're gonna go over the 2024 Board of Directors nomination process. We have some spotlights for members and projects. We'll have, uh, Beverly will tell us all about the results of this year's garden tour. We have door prizes that you all have signed up for. Treasures report, um, a few reminders on some upcoming events uh, and other reminders. So I would like to say a quick thank you to all of those who helped get this set up. So if you did hospitality or greeter or signage or any of those things, could you stand? Thank you. Thank you. It absolutely takes a village to pull some, these things off, that's for sure. And of course, we thank Global Spheres for the space. So um, I'd like to introduce you to Carolyn Roser. She'll come up here in just a second. She's from Dallas County, is a Dallas County Master Gardener. <clears throat> and I'm gonna read to you her bio because I thought it was pretty interesting. It said, grandmothers who were avid gardeners introduced Carolyn to gardening and she developed a lifelong need to be growing something in the garden. After becoming a Master Gardener in 2002, it's a long time. <laughs> Uh, Carolyn became fascinated with insects and took the specialist training in entomology at Texas A&M. Carolyn is also a master naturalist and has propagation certification from Texas Discovery Gardens. Today, she will share stories about the history, characteristics, and uses of plants through time. So let's welcome Carolyn. While she walks up, I'll get the first slide. For inviting me. This was really a great facility. I didn't, I've never been here before, didn't know this was here. This is great. And I've heard a lot about the Denton County Master Gardeners, though, over the years because I taught at TWU for 30 years. So <laughs> I did know about that. But the minute I retired, I retired in August of 2002 and I immediately started the Dallas County Master Gardener Program in August <laughs> too. So I had my retirement all planned. I was gonna be in the Master Gardener Program. So, and I have just loved it for 22 years, <laughs> so all right. But thank you for inviting me. This is a program that I developed uh, quite a while ago because I just got interested in the stories behind the plant. Not necessarily, I'm not gonna tell you how to grow the plants. I'm gonna tell you the stories about them. But first, just like with KERA, we have to have a Commercial at the beginning. Do you all do this too? Yes, yes. So, so this presentation is brought to you by the Dallas County Master Garden. Part of the AgriLife Extension and the Water Wise and Earth Kind Gardening that we promote. And this is a cartoon that I found uh, that I thought <laughs> lent itself to Waterwise Garden. What's your father doing? <laughs> <laughs> he 
He's walking in the rose in his garden, sweating on the plants, and I think we're going to be doing that in the next few days. And we have a help desk like you do. So. <laughs> okay, here we are. Now there will be no more commercials. <laughs> but all plants have a story to tell. And it's like if you had a book club, and this is Crankshaft's book club. And what book have you brought to share? It's a book that's really grown on me. The Acme Seed Catalog. That would be what a gardening book club would do. But all stories start out once upon a time. And what I'm going to do today in this presentation is tell you some of the plants that are connected to these things, pinking shears, or a bull, a bicycle built for two, the eye, and the ferris wheel. So we're gonna find out which plants are connected. The stories that plants tell can be about the flower itself and just how it grows, how it's named. It can be about the people who discovered it or named it. it can be about inspiration that the plant gives to people or the history associated with the plant. And Tennyson said, what is it, the name of the plant? A learned man could give it a clumsy name. Let him name it who can. The beauty would be the same. And yes, the beauty would be the same, but what is the problem with that? If we all name the plant something, you, you couldn't compare them couldn't compare the way you grew a plant with the way somebody else grew the plant because you didn't know the right name. And there are many plants that common, have lots of common names because it might be a different common name in by country. Sometimes it's a different common name just by the county. Or it can be just the culture it's in. So we all know what happened to fit us to be able to compare plants. And who was that person that let us do that? Linnaeus, right. Carl Linnaeus gave us a systematic classification for plants so we could compare them and know that it was the same plant. Now, Carl Linnaeus, I found, he started getting plants sent to him, and he would name them. And he named them sometimes from Latin, sometimes from Greek. Sometimes he named it by the person who found the plant. Uh, he named it where the plant was found. So he wasn't too systematic about what is how he was giving the names. But the other thing he did, he named them for his friends. So if he had a good friend, he's gonna name him for that friend. So what is in a name? What do we call this plant? Wisteria. Wisteria. Now, it was Carl Linnaeus that named it, and he actually named it Wisteria by mistake. It was supposed to be named after his good friend, Caspar Wistar, T-A-R. But a slip of the pen made it Wisteria. Either somebody couldn't read Linnaeus's handwriting or something. So poor Caspar Wistar never got to go down in history. But the name it 
as now is Wisteria frutescens, and it's part of the pea family, but it's native to the eastern part of the United States. And so in England, when they found this plant, they called it the Carolina kidney bean. <laughs> I, I had never heard that before. I thought that was interesting. They also, it's called the alcoholic plant because in Japan, it is a tradition when you're drinking sake to pour a little of the sake on the plant. And I'm sure that does make it grow <laughs> But this is a plant that I just love the name. The Busy Lizzie. I, isn't that just the greatest name? The Busy Lizzie. But it's called Impatiens, and it's got several names, Grandiloferia, Sultanii, Valeriani, but it was named Impatiens because of the way the seeds explode out of the pod. And I have never heard this, but other people who have say it's like um, Velcro ripping apart when the seeds pop out and they go several feet away. So that's why it was called impatience. It also <laughs> engendered some pretty bad poetry. <laughs> the impatience with rage and hate, the astonished grows alarms and hurls her infants from her frantic arms. I mean, that's a little too much. And they said the impatient seeds will soon skip out of the heads if they be but a little pressed with the fingers. Now, this plant was originally found in Zanzibar, and it was called Impatient Sultanii after the Sultan of Zanzibar at the time. Now the next plant we're going to talk about is the carnation. Now, yeah, if you can hand these out to seven people that have their readers because they're, you're going to need readers. You, you. I've got my readers, Carol. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so we're. Oh, she's got her readers over here. All right. Anybody else? Michelle? Yeah, we've got to give them all out because. They were also, in England, called pinks. Now, the original flower was found in Spain, and they were pink. Now we've got all sorts of things, but they were pink. In Anglo-Saxon language, there was no word for the color pink. So when these flowers came to England, they didn't know what to call them, and they didn't call them by, by the color, but they had a term called poinkin, and poinkin referred to the edges of the flower, and if you look at how the edges have, they're sort of decorated on the edge, and if you look at this, you can see how they're indentations, and it is a pretty edge, and they call them poinkins, 
which turned into pinks. And here we go. That's where we get the term pinking shoes. <laughs> Chaucer, who wrote a lot about flowers, I was really surprised about that, but Chaucer called the carnation sops in wine. Because what they found that in Spain, what they did was they put the carnations in their wine and supposedly it flavored the wine. So he called them sops in wine. And the Crusades in the 13th century, they were putting in the carnations into their wine. And this is St. Louis. And he, in the Crusade, he did well. <laughs> and his men didn't uh, get the plague. And he thought it was because he had been putting the carnations in the wine. <laughs> oh, I don't think so. <laughs> Okay, those of you who have the flower, what does it smell like? Yes. There a thing? Anybody? Does it smell clean? Fresh? Think of a spice. Does it smell like a spice? What kind of spice? What do you say? Clothes. That's what it should, it's supposed to, but years ago I'm sure it smelled more like clothes than it does now. But it's, it does, it smells like clothes. That reminded people of nails. The nails reminded people of the crucifixion. And so a lot of the artists at the time years ago, at the time, would put carnations into their paintings, and that was to symbolize the crucifixion. So how they got there, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> between men and women who weren't supposed to be talking to each other or seeing each other. And they would put messages inside the carnation. And supposedly, when Marie Antoinette was in the Bastille, they smuggled in messages through the carnation and with a, an escape plan for her. However, we know that didn't work out. <laughs> but what I want you to do now, those of you who have the carnations, I have a message in there. And they are little tiny, tiny pieces of paper with a word on them. So you have to keep looking, and you might have to almost tear it apart. She found one. What did it? What did it say? Midnight. Midnight. In the. In the. What you got? Me. Okay, me. Come. 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 Is there a meet me? By the. By the. Fountain. Fountain. At midnight, right? Didn't we have a midnight? Okay, come and meet me by the fountain at midnight. But it is, it really isn't easy to find those, is it? No. So that was a good way to send messages. <laughs>
Okay, here we're back to Crankshaft and Kids Book Club. The most important part of the actual seat catalog is the plot. Because it's the size of the plot that determines how many seats you need. <laughs> Now, the next plant is interesting just by the way it grows. Um, and that's mistletoe. But it has a really interesting scientific name. It's a tongue twister. Foradendron tomentosum. How can you say that very fast? <laughs> For a dendron tomentosa. And it means tree thief because it is somewhat parasitic. But the mistletoe comes from an Anglo Saxon word, mistletan. And that means a twig with dung on it. <laughs> because the birds would sit and eat the berries in from the mistletoe and then sit there. Okay. And sometimes in literature, I have found uh, references to the golden bough because the leaves of the European species are sometimes yellow. So they called it the golden bough. Now this is a picture. You can see how sticky those seeds are. It's, it's unbelievable. These seeds have already been through the intestinal tract of a bird. And they're still this sticky. And it just attaches to the tree. And here we see a lot on hackberries and mesquites and cedar elms especially. <coughs> It will slow the growth of the tree. This poor tree is in trouble. It grows into the xylem, so it only is taking the water from the tree, but it's able to make its own food. The way it grows, the first year, the seed has to attach. That sticky seed has to stick onto the tree. Now, in places where there is a lot of rainfall during the year, it can wash off the seeds. Here in North Texas, we don't have enough to wash off the seeds, and that's why we have so much mistletoe. So the first year, the seed has to attach. Then the second year, it grows one pair of leaves. That's it. The third year, it grows two pairs of leaves. And then after that, it just continues growing. So if you get to it for the first, second, or third year and pull it out, if you can get up that high, you can stop it from growing. And these are some of the birds here in this area that just love the mistletoe. And they really need the mistletoe during the winter to eat. We also have the great purple hair streak butterfly. The host plant is the mistletoe. So the mistletoe isn't all bad. It gives us <laughs> these beautiful butterflies. And then we have the Ferris wheel. How is it connected to mistletoe? Well, it's not directly, <laughs> but this is a picture of the original Ferris wheel, the very first one at the Chicago World's Fair in the 1890s. There was a, an engineer in, named Ferris, and he built this. This is the very first one, and it is so big. Each of these cars is a railway car. Wow. You could get 200 people in each one. Wow. 
I mean, I've never seen another one that big. And, and that was the very first one. So, but this was at the World's Fair and all the states and territories could have a pavilion. And what they were encouraged to do is bring uh, plants and things from their state or their territory and decorate their pavilion. So what did the state of Oklahoma do? They said that the mistletoe, a parasitic plant, was the emblem of Oklahoma. <laughs> They have now, their state flower now is the rose, so they changed. <laughs> but I do not think of roses growing rampant in Oklahoma. But okay, but it was the, that was their emblem. We also found that the Druids in England, really uh, during the winter, they would go out and pick the mistletoe off the trees. They would have ceremonies to do it and then take it in and decorate their houses. So sort of bringing the greenery in, they started that using mistletoe. And then we have kissing under the mistletoe. Charles Dickens in Pickwick Papers gave us a tradition and what he said they could do is you would hang the mistletoe with the berries on it, and if someone stood under it, a kiss could be stolen. And then you had to pluck one of the berries. <coughs> Once all the berries were gone, no more stealing of kisses. That's what I mean. <laughs> Okay, here we have crankshaft again. I'll warn you right up front that the Acme Seed Catalog is not a quick read. It's not something you can plow through and then sit it. Okay, now we have the daisy. All right. We're going to pass out some daisies. And what you can do is just pull out, you know, just pull off and give them out as many as, as, many as you can. can. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but the daisy is just a lovely plant. Thank you. It's called Bellus perennis. And it has a lot of common names. Marguerite, ox eye daisy, flea bean daisy, and here in this country it was called white weed. It was called white weed because it came from, the ox eye daisy came from Europe. And of course the settlers coming here, they thought it was a nice flower, they brought the seeds, they planted it and it just took over. It did become a weed in the crops of all the farmers, so it was called the white weed here. But the, the term daisy that we know comes from an old English word that means day's eye. And isn't that a sweet name? I think it's a much better name than ox eye daisy. <laughs> It must look like an ox eye. An ox must have a yellow eye. I don't know. But I like the term daisy much better. Luther Burbank developed the Shasta daisy. And that's probably the ones that we plant in our yards. And it's from the ox eye and a Japanese species. How many of you have been to Luther Burbank's garden? Okay, one person there, okay. What mountain can you see from his garden? <laughs> Mount Shasta, and that's why they called it the Shasta Daisy. There you go. There
there are some native um, daisies, the Blackfoot and the flea bean. And the Blackfoot, I, I just love that plant. I, I had it all over my yard and it, it would just come up. It was sort of biennial and I, I just, a low ground cover that I just love. But we find in literature some reference to the daisy. Pushing of daisies. There we go. Shakespeare. Now I have never heard of Cymbeline. Has anybody else ever read Cymbeline? But anyway, there was a general who buried his dead soldiers in fields of daisies. So they were pushing up the daisies. We also found that Keats wrote about that he would soon be dead and the daisies growing over him. And Robert Burns wrote a whole poem to a mountain daisy with the, relating his death to a flower being plowed under. Now, fresh as a daisy. We all know what fresh as a daisy means. And that comes from a very obscure book, but at the time it was very popular in, the, in 1834. And it just took, the phrase took over. Everybody liked this phrase and started using it but nobody ever remembers the book or the, <laughs> the author, but we remember that phrase. Okay. We get the tradition of looking at the daisy and plucking the petals to say, loves me or loves me not. And it might have gotten started with Chaucer because he talked about a woman who was turned into a daisy and each petal represented one of her virtues. So you were supposed to pull off the petals. Okay, now those of you who have the daisies, want you to start counting the petals. <laughs> You can pull them apart if you want, just count the petals. We'll see if you're going, if it's going to be loves me or loves me not. 29. 29. 34. Another 29. A 34. Another 34. 35, 35, 35, 27, 35, 35, that seems to be the number for these. <laughs> well, what, the oxide daisy, 90% of the flowers are going to have an uneven number of petals. So that means what? That means loves me, loves me not, loves me. So 90% it's going to be loves me. And there was another uh, phrase that they used, when will a wedding be? This year, next year, sometime, never, this year. Okay. So it was a good percentage that they were going to be loves me. <laughs> all right, now, it, do you all have a choir? <laughs> well, yeah, I don't know. Are you right? <laughs> you might be singing, I don't know. But you're going to have to sing now because I can't. <laughs> so we're going to have to start and I want you to sing the Daisy song. Just think of it. Daisy, Daisy, give me your answer to Yeah. <laughs>
interesting story, a lot of interesting stories are about the botanists who found these plants because they endured shipwreck, they endured um, disease, they endured wild animals, trying to find a plant, looking for new plants. And one of the men who did this was David Douglas. David Douglas came from Kew Garden. How many of you have been to Kew Garden? Oh, lots, okay. He came from Kew Gardens in the early 1800s, and they sent him to find new plants in the Pacific Northwest. And what he found, and it was named after him, the Douglas fir and a Douglas primrose up in the Northwest. However, he had a lot of unfortunate things happen to him. He could barely see. He decided, I'm not going to stay up in the Pacific Northwest. I'm going to go someplace better. So he went to Hawaii. And I thought that would, was a good choice. <laughs> but what he did was he hired a guide who was a convict. I guess you could do that then, I don't know, but anyway. And he was found in, gored to death by a bull. They had built some sort of a trap for this bull that was running loose. And evidently he either fell into it and then the bull fell in and killed him or the bull was already there and he fell in. Either way, we need CSI to tell us. <laughs> <laughs> but the guide was gone with all of his equipment too. So poor David Douglas did not live a long life. But that's not all about the primrose. It's also called prima rosa, which means first rose of the year, and cyclamen are primroses. But this is what we normally see and call a primrose. A Missouri primrose who gets in our gardens and gets it, just takes off everywhere. But the primrose is mentioned in the literature. Chaucer, he wrote a lot about flowers and he said that the miller's wife was a prima role. Shakespeare used the primrose path in both Macbeth and Hamlet. And in Hamlet, it's Ophelia that says, do not, as some ungracious pastor to do, show me the steep and thorny way to heaven, whilst like a puffed and reckless libertine, himself the primrose path of dalliance treads. <laughs> and in Macbeth, they said they were treading the primrose path to the everlasting bonfire. Okay, the very last one I want to talk about is what? The Xenia. <laughs> Okay. It's native to Mexico and southwestern United States. It started out as a little purple flower, and it was called in Spanish Mal de Ojos, which means what? Bad on the eyes or ugly. <laughs> they, they didn't think much of the Zenith. But the Spanish found it in um, Montezuma's garden, sent it back to Spain, and nobody heard much about it. And that was in 1520. But 
Then some seeds were sent back to the director of the Royal Gardens at Kew around 1785. And the seeds were sent back from the director's daughter-in-law, who was the wife of the ambassador to Spain. And it was in 1785 that they finally got back to England and the royal director there. The director, they said, was a ladies man, the director of Kew Gardens. What he did was Augusta, Princess Augusta, wanted her gardens re-landscaped. And she had him come. And they were always seen together walking by the lake and doing all sorts of things. But anyway, he was known as a ladies' man and had written a botany book just so that the women, he could give lectures to the garden clubs, probably. <laughs> but he came to a bad end. <laughs> said that he was trying to find a plant over a ledge, trying to get down. He fell and died as a result of his injuries. <laughs> but the zinnias that we have now are the hybrids. They came from the Burpee Seed Company in 1900. And the Navajo and the Apache had another name. For it. They called it the ever-changing woman because the little disc flowers would appear. But how is the zinnia related to the eye? But it is, and remember Linnaeus was always trying to name things after its friends. And he, he didn't even know where it came from, but he wanted to name it after a friend of his, Johann Zinn. But Zinn was already going to go down in history because he had found some little uh, filaments in the eye called, and they were eventually named the Zonules of Zen. So everybody remembers Zen's name and always with the Zen. So that is the story of the Zen. And may all your flowers keep blooming. <laughs>